You know how sometimes in life things just don't turn out the way that you planned? Well, this project was certainly one of those. So I'm going to take you on a journey of what happened with this project. So there's this glazed door that goes from our bedroom onto a little balcony which is kind of tricky to deal with in terms of window covering and for the last year more than a year we've just had this sort of hack job up there of this ikea curtain that we got from the reject pile which is fine but the curtain is way too long and rather than taking it up uh, we just kind of let it languish on the ground because I have been saying for so 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 long that I'm gonna make a curtain for this particular door and so me being me I decided to add making a curtain for this very door so I decided to add it to the ever-growing project list and I also decided that I was gonna learn a new skill and on top of all of that I decided to really 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 overcomplicate my life with the design of the actual curtain I've been seeing around the place these beautiful patchwork curtains that a lot of them use this Korean method called pojagi, which I apologize if I am not saying that correctly. I'm obviously not Korean and I don't really have that many Korean people in my life. So if there's any Koreans here who want to help us understand or learn how to pronounce this word correctly, then please put a phonetic description in the uh, comments below. That would be amazing. That's how I learned how to say some Swedish words from my graduation dress video like um Jätelilja <laughs> I can't I don't know if that's right and this method this Pujagi method uses essentially what is a flat filled seam so basically the raw edges of the seam get enclosed on themselves and they create these lovely lines I first came across this technique when I was watching Ji Won Choi who is an American Korean fashion designer who was on Making the Cut, which is a great show. I love that show. I feel very inspired by that show. And basically she uses this technique called Pajagi, but I think it also has some other names in my research. When I was looking up methods of how to do this technique, uh, there are some other words that I came across to describe it called Samsol and Jokabo. Again, if I'm mispronouncing those things, please help us out in the comments. That would be great. Basically, I think you use Jokabo, which is the, the actual patchwork technique to then make Bojagi, which is the, the um, finished textile that you then make. It's called like a wrapping cloth. So I guess you create the textile and then you make things out of that textile. I hope that makes sense. Or if I'm completely incorrect, then maybe someone who knows more about this can help me out. Thanks. Woo, tea break. The most civilized thing about cricket if people here don't know anything about cricket, when when you play the longest form of the game, it can go up for up to five days and they have lunch breaks and tea breaks. That's my kind of sport, tell you that much. <laughs> because we're all sustainable girlies here, I decided that I was going to use up the leftover fabric that I had from my IKEA um, Duno cover fabric that I used to make my graduation dress. I had tons and tons and tons of this white fabric left over. And that is basically where the story for this project begins. Once I'd made the decision to use the fabric, I decided then that I was going to dye it. And I was feeling kind of cocky because I had just been up at the farm dyeing some other things for other projects. Stay tuned. Part of the reason I wanted to dye it, I had this other brainwave where I thought about layering two pieces of the fabric together so that then I could create different saturations of the color that I was going to dye it. I'll get to more of that later. And so I did what I was good. I did, I did as I said. And so I got some dye from Draper's Fabrics, which is this Japanese dye that comes not in liquid format like the Rit dye, but it comes in powder format that you then brew into a potion and then you make the, the dye mixture from the potion and then you dye the fabric, obviously. So I did all of that, decided that it would be a great idea to do this at like 9.30 on a Tuesday thinking that, yeah, I was just going to be able to smash it out and get to bed at a reasonable hour. Uh, and I was kind of like dying it and having a shower after going for a run or something uh, at the same time. And so the dye job that I did was not great. It was not very even, but I wasn't really concerned because I knew I was going to be cutting it up into little panels and little strips 
We all know my time management is woeful at the best of times. And so I did the main dyeing in the evening and then the next night I did the dye fixative. That's important if you're dyeing fabric that you're gonna use for garments that you're gonna wash a lot so that the dye doesn't run into other things. You need to like dye it once and then you put on this stuff that like fixes the, fixes the dye. It's like the top coat on your nail polish. I didn't think I was going to be washing this curtain once I'd made it, but I decided to do the fixative just to be sure to be sure. I decided that this would be a great little activity to do up at the farm where there's lots of space and I had the place to myself. I spent the evening planning out the design. Basically, I'd done a couple of sketches in my little notebook that I keep where I go through my ideas and I spent the evening sort of using a scale ruler to make sure that I could calculate the pattern of the design into the actual sizing of the strips that I was going to need to cut and sew together. That's just, yeah, this, this is telling you that this thing is just way, 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 way too complicated, especially for a technique that I had at this point hadn't even tested out. So yeah, we're going really well here, Steph. I managed to bring every single thing that I needed except pins, but I decided to press on. Get it? What I didn't mention earlier is that the fabric is Lyocell, which is beautiful to wear. It's kind of slippery and lovely. It's kind of like a heavy satin silk feeling. In the, in the dyeing instructions, it, it had instructions for natural fibers and instructions for synthetic fibers. And I didn't know where Lyocell fell in this. After some research, I decided that it was gonna be closer to natural fibers. And I think it worked really well. And I really like the color that came out. It's just the distribution of the dye was not very even, uh, which was my own fault because I rushed that process because yeah, Tuesday night and I had to go to bed. I feel like I'm doing the like pitch report. I am Tony Gregg. This is the state of the pitch this morning on today's test, test match. Only Australians and people who like cricket will understand what I'm talking about. You can see the splotters here that are going to be a little bit tricky to deal with as we go throughout the day. But uh, looks like a good surface to be starting off with. Let's see how this pans out, shall we? So the fabric's really beautiful to wear. That's part of the reason that I chose that uh, particular Duna cover to make my graduation dress. But it is an absolute pain in the butt to sew when you're sewing together not one, not two, not three, but four layers of this slippery, dippery stuff. Very, 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 very tricky. And then to try and make them into very neat flat filled seams with these geometric straight lines. Look, and then try doing that without pins. Impossible, impossible. This project from the beginning was just cursed and I have no one to blame except myself because all it would have taken for me is to just do a little test piece and that would have demonstrated to me that this was going to be way too complicated to make using the method that I had dreamt up with these like layered pieces. Like what the hell? And then to put the layer on top of that of like making this into a YouTube video and the pressure of having this come out to be a beautiful amazing finished curtain project that I could show like the before and the after and the process and this beautiful and oh my god so neat and tidy and lovely. <sighs> Nobody needs that kind of stress. Why do I do this to myself? I asked that question to myself so 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 many times. <laughs> I honestly thought about just scrapping the video entirely, pretending like it never happened, going and making another beautiful curtain out of some beautiful thick grippy woven single layer linen or something and just reveal that. But I decided, no, there's value here. There's value in the lessons to be learned from my mistakes. So here they are. As I was sewing, especially towards the end, the song Dreamer by Supertramp just snuck into my brain and it just kept looping and looping and looping and looping, looping around. If you know the song, you'll know how annoying that could be. It was kind of like it was taunting me and I was getting increasingly frustrated with myself because basically I was just being kind of too much of a dreamer and really quite unrealistic with what I thought that I could achieve for this particular project. 
But then I remembered that since I started taking this channel a little more seriously about a year ago, I have dreamed up some absolutely wild projects that I have then committed to making and that have turned out really quite beautifully, such as my graduation dress, which I'm sure a lot of you here probably found my channel from that video, but there are other things that I've made. So many things that I dreamed up that I didn't know were possible that I then made into reality. And so lesson one, dream big and have a crack. Number two, for a pretty straightforward technique, if you have been sewing for a little while, like I have, I'm kind of embarrassed to tell you that I had to relearn this so many times because I just wasn't paying attention. If you are trying the Pojagi method or the Jokabo method, whatever uh, terminology you want to use, pay attention to which side is which. When you do the first line of stitching, your right sides will be facing together and then you stitch and then you press and then you fold it all over and then you top stitch again. And the top stitching is really gonna be on the back unless you want two lines of stitching to show. For some reason, my brain could just not comprehend this piece of information. And so there are several mistakes on my curtain and I, I cannot believe how long it took me to actually nail the method. Um, I also got frustrated and was procrastinating finishing, so I took some breaks and in that time I managed to just forget how to do it. That is basically a roundabout way of saying be present with what you're doing and pay attention. <laughs> and lesson 2a, 2b, two, lesson 2 part 2 is to just do a test. Do a test before you commit to something large scale. So much could have been avoided if I had just done a little test. Okay, I'm sure there are way more than three lessons in this project and maybe by the end of recording this I will come up with more. Something that I usually live by that I did not follow for this project is that fabric will either make or break a project. Related to part two, pay attention to what you're doing. If I'd just done a little test piece, or a lot of heartache and frustration <laughs> could have been prevented. And I truly believe that fabric choice is the most important part when it comes to any sort of project whether it be a garment or some other accessory or a curtain, whatever it is. I usually live by that mantra, but in this case I didn't and I paid the price. I think I was just paralyzed by learning a new technique that I then procrastinated getting started and I procrastinated by dyeing the fabric and designing the thing so many different times and spending so long on the design. I would have figured out very quickly that this was the wrong fabric had I just done a little test piece way, way, way earlier on in the project. I'll also admit that I'm a little embarrassed to put this project up as a video because I think that I have this expectation of myself that the things I put out there are things that I'm gonna be really proud of and look really resolved and beautiful. And that's what I hope to do. But I also wanna embrace maybe releasing a video for a project that isn't finished or isn't fully resolved to really share with you the whole process and the frustration that goes along with also creating things that do work out. Someone who really inspires me that I watch a lot of their YouTube content is Rachel Metz and she does a lot of DIY projects and sometimes she faces the same sort of feelings about putting up videos where she hasn't fully resolved the project or she takes apart and dismantle some of her other old DIY projects because she feels embarrassed or she feels ashamed. And I really appreciate when she puts those that kind of content out. I really appreciate her honesty when she does that in her videos. And part of having this channel for me is to be able to, to an extent, convey my authentic self and make sure that I make space for me to be able to do that. Sometimes there's a pressure here on YouTube, especially in the sewing and fashion space, to follow the formula for a video. So like, here's the starting point, here's the fabric, here's the process, here's the finish. But that's not how life works and I think we need to not force it so much uh, into that sort of mold. So here's a bit of a shit looking curtain, which will serve as a reminder to myself for ne the new skill that I've unlocked. But it's also gonna be an eyesore to make sure that I go and make a newer, even better, more beautiful one. And I also really, really, really need to paint the uh, green window frames, door frames, because they are hurting my eyes. 